uh, just a superbly um, appropriate speaker for this session that looks at a number of development challenges and development issues facing Cambodia. And um, if you think it's early here in Washington, 7 a.m. in Washington on, uh, on the 8th morning, Tuesday, the 8th morning of November, it is 4 a.m. where uh, Professor Sofal Ear is, which is in Arizona. And so he has graciously joined us at this very early hour to interact on, um, with you uh, journalists. And uh, as you know from the bio that was provided, he's a senior associate dean and associate professor at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University, where I just caught up with him. I've known him for years. He's been a colleague for years, but just caught up that during the pandemic, about a year and a half ago, he moved there from Occidental College, where he was previously. As you can see, he has just tremendous experience and on the ground work uh, relating to Cambodia and the region, uh, having worked in at UNDP, the World Bank, and elsewhere. And he's written a lot on aid dependence in Cambodia, foreign assistance, um, pandemic outbreaks, uh, et cetera. And he's a graduate of Princeton and Berkeley and moved to the US from France as a Cambodian refugee at age 10. So he brings just a number of cultural understandings, uh, academic um, uh, knowledge, and as well as on the ground and international experience to this topic of development issues in Cambodia. So we're delighted to have him. He, our, our other colleagues could not join us this morning. So we're gonna give Sofal a little extra time, maybe uh, kick off for maybe 15 minutes, Sofal. And then the journalists are just terrific and we'll pepper you with questions and comments right after. So off you go. All right, well, thank you, Satu. And thank you all for joining. Um, Again, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning for those of you at different time zones. Um, I am so grateful that you're here because it's such an important thing you're doing to uh, learn more about, uh, certainly about a country near and dear to me, Cambodia, where I was born, and, uh, and to learn about its interactions uh, with China, which of course are, are of extreme relevance to, to India. Um, yeah, I, I, I always tell my students at the Thunderbird School of Global Management that the real competitor of China uh, in the future is not the United States, it's, it's, it's India. And the actions of China have been very clearly to, um, to, to design its security strategy around the idea that India will be a competitor and to minimize India's potential going forward, but onwards to uh, the People's Republic of China and um, and Cambodia and development in Cambodia. So let me um, <clears throat> share my slides with you now and simply say that, you know, this relationship that, uh, that China has with, with Cambodia in terms of development is obviously one that, that um, uh, benefits China, benefits Cambodia, benefits the authorities in Cambodia. Also, of course, uh, benefits the people of Cambodia at some level uh, but uh, it's a complex one, and so it's it, there's not necessarily um, you know a definitive it's a good and bad answer to things. But that that relationship can often look like this, which is you know whether China in respect to Southeast Asia has become uh, a threat or a, a charm offensive in terms of the way in which China operates and interacts with the region, and returning to being a threat again. Uh, potentially, certainly for, 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 for claimant countries of the South China Sea who, uh, who don't agree with China's position on the debt nine dash line, uh, which is to take all of, of the South China Sea for itself. Uh, it is a threat for them. It's a threat to their future. It's a threat to their ability to uh, obtain maritime resources in the South China Sea or to navigate freely there. But, you know, at, at its core, it's a story about the golden rule. And uh, the golden rule isn't the golden rule that you think of. It's it's really this golden rule. Uh, he who has the gold makes the rules. And uh, for so much of of what China does, it is it is the idea that that China can can really um, use its uh, financial capital uh, and prowess to uh, to get countries to do things, and understandably so. I mean. You know, part of the story of, of Cambodia's relationship with China 
is that um, while Cambodia has has always maintained the the one China, uh, sorry, the the one <clears throat> one country, one China, sort of the one China policy. Um, it was after 1997 when there was a, a coup in the country that um, that the Prime Minister of Cambodia, Prime Minister Hun Sen, turned to China to essentially diversify the sources of, of aid that the country received. And by aid, I'm not talking about necessarily the traditional definition of aid, but basically financial assistance. How, how could Cambodia no longer be victim, in his view, of the IMF, uh, the West, cutting off, suspending aid, and then uh, diversify in other ways. So he went to China, he went to Pakistan even. He, he obtained resources so that he could then say, you know, in the future, if, this, if anything ever happens again, we've got other uh, funneling, uh, other sources of, 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 of funds. Um, and the region itself, as you well know, this is, these, these numbers are old, but um, is, you know, if you add Southeast Asia with the United States, you've got a billion people, which is why, of course, President Biden and and uh, a decade ago, President Obama came came out to the uh, ASEAN summit and and um, the uh, East Asian summit to essentially show that this pivot to Asia was happening. That there was more attention being paid by the United States, uh, rebalancing towards Asia, and deservedly so. <clears throat> now. Uh, we know that the level of uh, the the ownership of of the economy or the the control of of the economy uh, in terms of uh, Chinese hold on the economy, ethnic Chinese hold. This is not Beijing necessarily holding the economy at all. It's simply that ethnic Chinese uh, are particularly good at business, and in many of the countries of Southeast Asia, they have incredibly high percentages. I mean. Here, Laos showing 99%, that Cambodia 92%. It's it's it, it's an indication of of just how important uh, ethnic Chinese are, and some and at some level also a um, a an issue of of I think balance that needs to also take place. Why do countries like Malaysia and Indonesia uh, advocate for more Bumi Putras having a hold on the economy? Well, that's because there's in their view too much Chinese control. Uh, ethnic Chinese control of the economy. And it's certainly been China's game uh, in terms of um, going global, in terms of security. So uh, for Cambodia, there have been a lot of visits of, of Chinese generals over the years, along with um, <clears throat> uh, Cambodian generals visiting China and um, interacting. So they're, they're, they've clearly broadened their security relationship they have a lot of military exercises, um, equipment being donated. Uh, and it happens, of course, around the time of elections, which uh, when you have foreign military troops doing an exercise just weeks before an election, it sends a signal to the people uh, who are voting, right? It sends a signal that uh, whatever happens, the Chinese have the backs of the, of the ruling elites in Cambodia. Uh, Prime Minister who has been in power for 37 years. Um, so, you know, the Chinese presence in Cambodia has been um, long. If you actually go back centuries, um, uh, there have been um, Chinese visitors who've written about Cambodia. So Chu Taquan, it's not written here, but Chu Taquan was at Angkor Wat, for example, and describes the scene there. Um, during the Khmer Rouge period, you know, the Chinese uh, People's Republic of China certainly aided uh, the Khmer Rouge. Uh, they were, and as characterized by um, Andrew Murtha and his book, Brothers in Arms, really close. Um, and then there have been in the mid 90s, waves of investments in the garment industry. And over time, a shift towards energy, mining, agriculture, and, 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 and real estate. And now, of course, the latest is a, quite a bit of gambling and uh, on casinos, and then when the pandemic hit, it went into online gambling, and now possibly cyber slave uh, problem in Cambodia that is quite serious. Uh, much of Cambodia's hydroelectric power, as well as you will see a uh, few um, uh, coal-based uh, uh, electricity production and heavy fuels production 
is underwritten by the Belt and Road Initiative. We'll look at a map of that shortly. But um, you know, China's development, fin uh, de development finance assistance and soft loan focus have been on um, an infrastructure, and, and part of that is because China is going global. So you know, the Belt and Road uh, is, as you well know, a trillion plus dollar uh, uh, investment, commercial, uh, sometimes um, uh, uh, loans that. China uses to build infrastructure for countries, and those countries can sometimes end up in a heap of trouble. So from Pakistan to Sri Lanka, you've seen this happen, um, uh, where the Hambantota port, for example, is handed off. Uh, when the port of Gwadar uh, and elsewhere in Asia, there, 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 are, there are clearly signals uh, that the silk, the maritime silk road and the, um, the other, um, uh, pipelines and uh, railroad entry points of, of, of China uh, across the region are, are marking uh, their place. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, this, this is what we're looking at, this kind of you know, ports in places that are of use to, um, to, to China, uh, militarily possibly, although and on the surface, it's always commercial, right? So I mentioned Gwadar, I mentioned Hamantota. In, in Cambodia, there's Kohkong Newport, a deep water port that the Chinese have built, which is, has been characterized as, as unprofitable um, and, and really of, of, of questionable uh, economic value. Uh, and you'll see some images of that uh, shortly. And it's, it's literally in the middle of the jungle. How many tourists are they expecting to build a, a deep water port that can accommodate cruise ships uh, and a uh, airfield that can accommodate um, 787s, uh, clearly not that many. And even now, not many, not many do show up. Um, China's, as a source of aid to Cambodia here, uh, looks as though from the 2010s onward starts to increase, right, as a share. And, and later uh, decreases, and that's because if you characterize it as, as, as official development assistance. What China is giving is not official development assistance primarily. It's, it's loans that are um, that accrue interest that is not concessional in nature. Um, so anyways, I know that probably some of you have seen this before, but I just wanna share with you a quick clip here, a couple of clips of, of how China sees its activities uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's, it's, it's this little, uh, musical interlude that children uh, sing uh, here in this video explaining all of this. So let me play this for a second. Hopefully the audio will come through. The bell connects the land, the road moves on the sea. The promise that they hold is joint prosperity. We're breaking barriers, we're making history. The war we dream in I'll, I'll pause it here because obviously it's an earworm already and uh, may stay in your head all day. Uh, the tune is catchy. Uh, they also have a, a kind of storytelling version where the uh, uh, father and daughter uh, talk about, uh, about the Belt and Road. So let me share that quickly here. Time for bed, sweetie. Okay, Papa. Now, Bob's gonna be gone a few days this month and I'll miss you. Why? I'm going to attend a forum in Beijing on the Belt and Road Initiative. What's that? Okay. Once upon a time, several routes led from China through Central Asia to Europe. It was called Silk Road. People would put things on camels and cross the desert to trade with other people. Like country sharing? Yeah. 
Anyways, more of that kind of explanation. And of course, it's China's view of itself here. It's, it, these are the official uh, news outlets, the China Daily and so on, um, uh, disseminating this kind of interpretation of the Belt and Road. And, and certainly for China, it is what I uh, have characterized as a win, 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 win. Um, excess Chinese capital is invested. Uh, there is sometimes no tender, or if there is a tender, uh, it's obviously going to go to a Chinese firm. Uh, the firm, of course, employs Chinese workers, many of whom, most of whom are men, because that's the construction work that takes place, and often criticized as being far too heavily and all, 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 sometimes entirely um, driven by, by Chinese workers. So there's not opportunity for locals to actually do construction. Um, if because of the uh, imbalance in the sex ratio in, in China, that these men find spouses, I like to say, then good for them. They, they then can find families and, and move forward in their lives because out in China, they have to compete with an excess of, 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 of men um, uh, from a demographic standpoint. When things go wrong, of course, they, you do a debt equity swap as happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, in the 99-year lease of Hamantota Port, which, you know, I think was was a, a real wake-up uh, call for um, for a lot of countries. And now with Sri Lanka having all of its financial crisis, we see again a country that it does not go to a lender of last resort because, you know, the IMF and the World Bank will require conditions and so on, uh, and instead uh, will uh, will take money from China first. Um, in order to avoid all of that. Uh, so in the case of Hamantora, 292 million in exchange for taking over the port, but of course it's to pay back, I'm sure the, the loans. Um, Vice President Pence uh, was first to, to start pushing the idea of debt uh, diplomacy and, and, and of course the related term debt trap diplomacy. So um, in a speech he gave uh, when he was still vice president, he said, in fact, China uses so-called debt diplomacy to expand its influence today. That country is offering hundreds of billions of dollars in infrastructure loans to governments from Asia to Africa to Europe and even Latin America. Yet the terms of those loans are opaque at best and the benefits invariably flow overwhelmingly to Beijing. Just as um, just as Sri Lanka, which took on massive debt to let Chinese state companies build a port of questionable value. Uh, two years ago, that country could no longer afford its payments, so Beijing pressured Sri Lanka to deliver the new port directly into Chinese hands. It may soon become a forward military base for China's growing blue water navy. And uh, it doesn't just include, uh, obviously, deep water ports, but you know, airports, in this case, an airport that was pre-pandemic, the world's emptiest, built in the, I think, the home province uh, of the president, then president of Sri Lanka, who... Uh, I guess, wanted a prestige project that had no commercial uh, value. So um, whether this airport has military value is another question. But um, anyhow, I promised earlier a map of, of uh, the kinds of uh, Belt and Road initiatives taking place in Cambodia. And, and if, if this list were expanded, it, it would be a dozen plus projects. They include, for example, uh, Phnom Penh, the new Phnom Penh International Airport, which is still being finalized. Uh, the Siem Reap International Airport, which is the gateway to Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat being, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the world monuments, and and uh, of course a former Hindu temple that was converted to uh, Buddhism. Uh, but um, you've also got hydroelectric dams. Um, uh, coal-powered uh, uh, coal uh, power plants, uh, heavy fuels power plants, and the new expressway, for example, to Sihanoukville, uh, which is uh, really Cambodia's first major express, just real expressway. In fact, they won't even allow anything under 250 cc's motor-wise. So I imagine that this is going to be the road for the uh, the, the super rich to drive their um, their Bugatti Veyrons and and Ferraris and Lamborghinis, um, which of course these days don't have don't ha did, up until now didn't have a road like that to to to, to get on. Um, there is also here uh, the Cambodia China Comprehensive Investment and Development Pilot Zone, and, and 
Dar es Salaam Seashore Resort. That is the resort that I mentioned earlier. That is, of of truly, this is Kong Newport, truly of questionable value, um, and one has to wonder why, why again, uh, such an investment in in the middle of the jungle. But of course, it's not just roads, bridges, empty airports, ports. Uh, there's private investment in high rises, condos. Uh, there's casinos. Uh, the, with the money that it's not money that comes from the BRI, obviously. This is money, private investor money, which is signaled by the Chinese authorities as like, okay, well, we're friends with Cambodia, so we want to have, uh, so it's it's safe for you to invest here. You know, you won't lose your money. So 150 casinos, and uh, and the numbers are are fascinating. I mean, in the city of Sihanoukville, you have uh, 156 hotels of which 150 are Chinese owned, uh, 436 restaurants of which 414 are Chinese owned, um, casinos, 62 of which 48 are Chinese owned, and karaoke clubs, 41, massage parlors, 46. This used to be a small uh, beach resort city. It's now a monstrosity. Uh, even Cambodians who uh, have few problems with the Chinese money that comes in complain that their their beach resort is gone and they can't have anything more now the pandemic has had um it has taken its own toll on the uh, on the casinos and what started happening as i'm sure you're you may be aware is that um the uh, money laundering elements and 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 mafia elements of of just casino the casino underworld converted a lot of this into um, basically cyber slave fraud factories. And so uh, recently there was an Al Jazeera um, uh, uh, show uh, on 101 East uh, that, uh, that detailed some of this. And I'll show you the trailer for it. They target people around the world. I lost over $300,000. Chinese cyber scam operations stealing tens of billions of dollars. These are sophisticated criminal enterprises. <laughs> Committing not just fraud, but atrocities. Many of their workers, victims too. Trafficked, enslaved, and forced to scam. <laughs> Even children. Southeast Asia's Cambodia is a hotbed of these criminal enterprises. 101 East talks to victims of global scam operations and investigates the Chinese companies behind them and their links to the Cambodian elite. So obviously very concerning, uh, uh, numbers as high as uh, 100,000 cyber slaves possibly, and, and it isn't just in Nookville uh, on the uh, co coast, uh, but in Bavet on the Cambodian-Vietnam border, uh, there was a, um, a casino turned fraud operation that saw this recently, which was um, the organized escape of 40 plus uh, cyber slaves who were who were Vietnamese apparently, and who who swam across a river that was next to the next to the uh, casino back to Vietnam. So a lot of this is incredible, uh, incredible side. I mean, it's literally um, people running for their lives uh, and to freedom back to communist Vietnam because they're safer there. Um, and um, uh, so 
some of the workers actually that have been expelled from the, the Sienikville operation are being moved to Bavet, where there are apparently vacancies because these folks have escaped. Uh, other other types of investments include real estate, where um, a lot of it is in uh, the capital city, for example, on Diamond Island. Uh, this building here, of course, is completed, but so much of it is owned by Chinese back in China that at night the lights aren't even on on uh, on these buildings. Um, uh, the, the condos aren't aren't occupied, and it's because they're owned, but they're not. Nobody's staying in them. Nobody's living in them. Uh, a lot like these ghost cities, right? So, uh, ghost cities in in China, uh, ghost cities in Cambodia, and even though Xi Jinping has said houses are, are built to be inhabited, not for speculation, um, it might it might be something he's saying to the Chinese real estate market, especially with Evergrande having the problems that it's now having. But in uh, the rest of the world, in Cambodia, this is a problem that is driven in large part by Chinese uh, real estate investment efforts that, uh, that are resulting in higher property prices. Um, it's great for those who own the land, they, they make money, but for those who actually need housing, this doesn't work for them. Part of the thinking that, that China exercises, I think it can be characterized in, in what Xi Jinping, when he was still vice president and doing a kind of uh, world tour, uh, ended up saying at the um, uh, Chinese embassy in Mexico one day, back in February, 2009, he said, there are a few foreigners with full bellies who have nothing better to do than try to point fingers at our country. China does not export revolution, hunger, poverty, nor does China cause you any headaches. Just what else do you want? And I think that's the, the real logic of the relationship between China and Cambodia. Both China and Cambodia kind of have this idea that that uh, the West is out to export revolution in, in, in their country. And so Cambodia will say, now there's this color revolution that they're trying to do in Cambodia, trying to uh, remove the legitimately elected government of Cambodia. And of course it's hardly illegitimate insofar as um, the last few elections have been without the main opposition party. So it's, it's like an election without <clears throat> your main opponent. Um, and that's how they'd like to have it. But obviously, <clears throat> this is problematic when you talk of democracy. Um, I mean, it would be like, you know, a major party in India being completely canceled and not allowed to run. And so what China has given to Cambodia has been over the years, you know, gifts of infrastructure. In 1999, it was the, uh, the Senate complex for Cambodia, which includes a, a golf range in the, in the back. In uh, 2009, and, and it's like clockwork, li literally a decade later, it was a uh, council of ministers building with a kind of pyramid in the middle that was supposed to be the prime minister's office, which he then refused to use because of uh, for feng shui reasons. Um, and in 2019, 2020, it was the um, ministry of defense building of which I don't have a picture here, but um, trust me, it's another monstrosity, architecturally speaking. Uh, China's been <clears throat> also very generous to Cambodia, and Cambodia in turn has done what China wanted. So, um, uh, you know, when Uyghurs ended up in Cambodia, about twenty of them, um, in two thousand nine, it was it was uh, Cambodia that sent them back the day before one point two billion dollars was signed uh, with Xi Jinping uh, by private charter back to China, and they've never been heard from since then. So, you know, this is, it's fascinating. I, I think I'm speaking more than the 15 minutes that, um, that Satu gave me. So I, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm not running over. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just give you a little bit of that sense of the airfield that is, take, that is taking shape at Daras Accord. This is an earlier picture, but it was already characterized as the longest uh, runway in Cambodia, longer than even the one at Phnom Penh International Airport. And so what is the reason for something like this? Why would there be a need for such a runway, whether it's you know, fighter jets landing, drones taking off, Chinese drones, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that have, been, that have fallen from the sky actually. And then the Cambodians are like, what is this? Uh, we don't know what this vehicle or who is operating this. And then they find out that it probably took off from this airfield. Um, but it's a relationship that I think is mutually beneficial for the 
um, for for the Cambodian authorities and and for Beijing, uh, right? So they they parrot uh, Xi Jinping's uh, governance of China book uh, and translate it into Khmer, for example, and uh, and and it, somehow they think this is going to make them uh, <clears throat> friends with um, uh, closer friends with China, and it, it certainly has caused. You know this incredibly close friendship, uh, far more than a country of 17 million people in Cambodia would suggest, uh, could could possibly uh, take the attention of a country of 1.3 billion. But again, China, Cambodia is a country that votes in ASEAN, which uses a veto system, and so Cambodia can block things that China is displeased with. So in 2012, it did block mention of uh, of any code of conduct situation or South China Sea. Uh, and so it, it stopped, uh, it did what, what China wanted. And then on top of that, it actually said that ASEAN leaders had agreed to not internationalize the South China Sea, which was a term that the Chinese Ministry of uh, Foreign Ministry uses. So it was like they took the words from the Chinese Foreign Ministry and put it in the mouths of ASEAN leaders. Of course, the Philippines disavowed that and said it's it's not at all what we said. And within Cambodia, the price has been terrible. I mean, you've had... Labor leader Chia Vichia, um, uh, uh, environmental activist Chut uh, political analyst Kem Le, all assassinated under very suspicious circumstances, um, and um, and never any justice really for them. And meanwhile, the Prime Minister of Cambodia says, "Let us solve our problems ourselves." Countries which are outside of the region always slap our heads and tell us what to do. I raise this issue not as a message to it for any particular country, but I would like to say that these Mekong countries are, are the political victims. So I request outsiders of the region who don't know about the issues to let us solve our problem. He went on to say at the time, this was a few years ago, Myanmar is accused of genocide, but do you all understand about Myanmar? Do you know about Myanmar? They have to solve a lot of challenging issues in relation with security. The countries that do not know our countries, please leave us to solve our problems for ourselves. And so as a result, you know, he would like everybody to butt out, uh, except of course China, um, and to butt out of, of Cambodia's internal affairs. And so it means dissolving the, the opposition party. It means rewriting a narrative, um, you know, like white papers published by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and uh, international cooperation titled To Tell the Truth in which um, you know they tell their their version of the story and 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 longer papers still that that try to characterize you know political situation in Cambodia strengthening the rule of law and liberal demo democratic process in which the preamble states real democracy this is the prime minister saying real democracy in Cambodia has not been set back or fallen it's that it has been protected and strengthened in accordance with the principle of the rule of law for the great benefit of the people and nation. Only fake democracy has been abolished. Uh, taking it, uh, inspiration uh, from uh, then President Trump uh, and calling things that are real fake and fake that are real. But that is a game that happens in Cambodia and I'm sure happens elsewhere across the world uh, where politicians use a reality distortion field to kind of um, refract the truth. Um, and of course, it's especially poignant in Cambodia where, you know, under the Khmer Rouge, there was a ministry of truth. And so uh, really, we have sort of the continuation of this. Uh, the truth is not really what it seems to be in Cambodia, at least according to the prime minister. Um, but I'll, I'll end it here. I have other slides, but I want to allow, of course, for questions. And I know this is one of my Thanks. favorite little clips here. Um, Thanks so much, Sofo. Yes, I, I know no we could go on and you could show clips yes, and I they're could. fascinating yes. 